Hello everyone. Uh, hello Jean. Uh, hello. Today we are recording the fifth video of our six-part uh, interview, um, and uh, today we will um, we will talk about uh, the objections of uh, the Broibom theory. And if you haven't watched the last video, the previous video uh, about the Broibom theory, we highly recommend you to uh, to watch it. Uh, because um, yes, we you have to you need uh, like a, a, a grasp uh, on the the fundamental ideas of the, the this theory to understand the objection and the the answers that uh, Jean will give to these objections. So I leave the floor to Jean. Thank you very much, Arno. So I will um... oh, I will share the screen first. And then I will do that. And uh, I have to um, affichar. Um, uh, okay. So now, as I, as I know, say, we're going to look at a number of more or less common objections to the Breuil-Bohm theory. I will start for a more general or, if you wish, philosophical objection and then move on to more technical ones. First question, I mean, I will list them. Isn't the De Bruyne-Bohm theory a return to classical physics? Well, it all depends what you mean by classical physics. If you mean that the De Bruyne-Bohm theory describes a world that exists outside of laboratories and whose functioning is independent of them or independent of observers, then yes, the theory is classical, but you can also simply say that this is an ordinary physical theory. The motion of the particle is very non-classical. For example, in the two slit experiment, we have seen this picture, Newton's first law is not respected because here you are in vacuum, there are no forces, there are no potential, and then particles should follow uniform rectilinear, rectilinear trajectories. That's Newton's first law. And obviously this is not the case. Two, isn't the De Bruyne Bohm theory refuted by the no-hidden variable theorems. That's something we already discussed in the previous video, so I won't go into too many detail. You see, the theory does not introduce the hidden variables that are impossible to introduce according to these theorems. We saw in the previous video that there is no spin value pre-existing to the measurement of spin, and that the velocity measurement does not measure the velocity as it was before the measurement. So the De Bruyne theory, therefore, does not introduce hidden spin or velocity variables. Isn't the De Bruyne boom theory refuted by Heisenberg's inequalities? This is also something we've discussed before, because from the point of view of the De Bruyne boom theory, these inequalities refer to product of the dispersion or variance, if you wish, of result of measurements of the position of the velocity. Since the result of the De Bruyne boom theory are statistical, there will always be some dispersion in the result of measurement of those position and velocities. And if you look at the De Bruyne-Bohm theory, it implies that the product of this dispersion will satisfy Heisenberg's inequalities. But in the De Bruyne-Bohm theory, these inequalities have no special or fundamental or quasi-philosophical status as is often the case in orthodox quantum mechanical description discussions. In particular, they do not demonstrate that there is an intrinsic randomness in nature, or there are absolute limits to our knowledge. Yes, but the De Bruyne-Bohm theory is non-local. This was certainly a valid objection in 1952, and I think it was raised, at least implicitly, by both De Bruyne and Einstein. But after 64 and Bell's result, or if you wish, after the experiment verifying the validation of Bell's inequalities, the situation changes completely. Indeed, in videos two and three, we explain that EPR Bell reasoning shows that nature is non-local, regardless of the truth of quantum mechanics. And therefore, the non-locality of the De Bruyne-Bohm theory is a quality, not a defect. If this theory were local, it would be refuted by the EPR Bell reasoning. Now, can't we invoke Occam's razor to eliminate trajectories and keep only the wave function? Occam's razor is a philosophical principle going back to uh, scholastics thinker Occam that you should not introduce entities beyond necessity. You should not introduce more beings than is necessary. And so you could say, well, let's get rid of the trajectories. 
The problem is that as we explained in the first video, we do not know what the wave function means outside the laboratory. It is sometimes said that it contains all the information we have about the physical system. But this is tantamount to assuming that the system has properties before any measurement, properties that are in fact hidden variables. If you, if you, you know, and the problem is then to specify what these properties are and whether their mere existence is not forbidden by the no hidden variable theorems. The De Bruyne-Bohm theory introduces such properties, namely the position of particles, but nothing else, and deduce from them what happens when other quantities are measured. So, um, basically, if you if you get rid of the the trajectories or, or if you get rid of the positions of particles, uh, you just have no ontology in quantum mechanics. Exactly. So yes, so it it will be very. I don't know, uh, weird to uh, to apply Occam razor to, to get rid of uh, particles position. Yeah, I mean, I think people people give a meaning to the wave function, which is not always clear, you see. Yes. That's a problem. Anyway, the De Bruyne-Bohm theory makes no other prediction about quantum mechanics was the point of the theory. Well, in the fourth video, we answered this objection already. The De Bruyne-Bohm theory is not another theory or an interpretation, but a completion of it. It is the theory of the world from which one deduces what happens in the laboratories. That behavior agrees with ordinary quantum mechanics. Ordinary quantum mechanics is therefore a consequence of the De Bruyne-Bohm theory. The De Bruyne-Bohm theory serves to give us a clear view of the quantum phenomena and to get rid of re any reference to an observer outside the system or to the vague notion of measurement. It changes nothing in practice to how we are doing physics, but it does eliminate whole libraries of bad philosophy, mysticism, and incomprehensible physical statements, as we have seen in the pre in the first video. Seven, isn't the existence of real particle position more of a metaphysical question than a physical one? As a friend of mine, Roderick Tumulka, who is also defender of the Breitbaum theory, points out an ancient astronomer might have said that the position of planet in three-dimensional space cannot be observed. We don't see where the planets are in three dimension, and we should therefore limit our theory to describing the movement of the planets as it appears to us, namely on the surface of a sphere against the background of fixed stars. Such a point of view would certainly have influenced physics. I'm not sure how, but it would, and would therefore have been more than just metaphysical interest. That's why I don't see why the existence of trajectories shouldn't be a physical question. It's a physical question about what can we say about the world, again, outside of laboratories. But since we cannot measure these trajectories, we cannot know them, so do they have any physical meaning? The answer is that's a mistake to think that we can only know what we can be measured directly, or worse, to pretend that only what we can measure exists. There was a long discussion between Einstein and Heisenberg in 1926 when they met. And Einstein made a remark that I think Heisenberg did not completely either understand or agree with. He says it's the theory that tells us what is observable. It's always the theory, because when you see, for example, you detect an electri electric current, for you have a, a meter that tells you what the electric current is, is the theory that tells you how that works and why what you see on the needle, or maybe there are no needles anymore, but on the needle of the of the meter uh, uh, tells you how, what the electric current is. It, it, that uh, that's that's the theory. You, you don't see an electric current. You never see any anything directly. I mean, the thing which you see directly is related to what's happening in the world through the theory. Because the, 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 sorry, I, I, the the functioning of the measurement apparatus is is. Uh, explained by uh, by the theory, you mean? Yeah, of course. Yes. The theory tells you what the measurement device works. Mm. It's a theory that tells you that the measuring device measures something. Mm. And for example, if you know what you know about dinosaurs or the temperature inside the sun, this is known indirectly. You, know, mm. you never put a thermometer inside the sun to what the temperature is. A, a theory that tells you how this uh, conversion function, and then we deduce from that. Of course, we can never be sure. Of course, the dinosaur, we only have bones of dinosaur. That's the only thing we observe, but then we reconstruct, you know, from various knowledge and maybe speculation, what the life of the dinosaurs was like. And, you know, it's also interesting that in the Debrel-Bohm theory, 
it's very easy to reconstruct the trajectory by detecting it as a single point. If you detect it here, then the theory tells you it followed that path, mm. and in particular, it went to that hole. If you detect it here, you know it went to that hole. So you know uh, the trajectory, if you wish, by detecting it at one point, of course, if you believe the theory. What people, well, I think what people think when they talk about measuring the trajectory is the possibility to observe it constantly, like if you film a racing cyclist, for example, or a car or something like that. And in the quantum case, this measurement would disturb the system and the trajectory followed would be different from the one that would be followed in the absence of measurement. That's true. But on the one hand, why is it surprising? To perceive something microscopic, you must necessarily interact with the microscopic uh, with the microscopic world by means of a macroscopic apparatus because it's only the macroscopic apparatus that is observable directly by us. And of course, you would expect that this uh, apparatus would disturb the microscopic object. On the other hand, the disturbed trajectory, if you keep on measuring the trajectory, it will disturb, but it will still be a trajectory obeying the real bone theory, it will simply be different from the unobserved trajectory. Once you think in terms of observation, don't have a central hole, they're just interaction with the world, there's nothing mysterious or shocking here. Now let me go to the more technical objections. The first one, which I hear often, and was put forward by, I think, Wolfgang Pauli, is that the De Bruyne-Bohm theory pri privileges the position variable over all others. In particular, it breaks the symmetry between position and momentum. There is a sense in which in quantum mechanics, you can write the wave function as a function of position or a function of momentum. And many people make a lot of fuss about it and think it's a very deep truth. But first of all, there is no such symmetry in quantum mechanics. If you write the Schrodinger equation, you write it in the space of position variable. Of course, you can always do a Fourier transformation and write it in momentum variable, but then it becomes complicated and unnatural. But moreover, measurement of our observation, we can make always ultimately be expressed in terms of position. For example, the speed is defined in terms of position. If you measure, the, what is the speed? The speed is the distance traveled divided by an amount of time. And maybe you make it infinitesimal, you make it very small if you want the instantaneous speed instead of the average speed. But nevertheless, this is defined in terms of position. I don't think you can define position if you use only the speed, you see. And here, when you have this measurement of the spin, then you see that the particle which starts here goes there. And then if you detect the particle there, it's a fact that you can forget the wave function here, okay? And then what, anyway, what is, that comes later, but the point is that it's by you measuring the, the position here that you know that the spin is up. You define the spin being up depending on where you see the particle, where the particle goes. So it's defined again by the position. And the privileged role of the position is natural and you predict particle position correctly, you can also predict the result of all other measurements correctly because these measurements ultimately are measurement of uh, position. Now the pilot wave moves the particle, but the particle has no influence on its wave. Why is there no action reaction? That's a, con a concept which comes from Newton's third law and uh, people are a bit confused about that. And I don't see exactly why there should be such a reaction. In classical physics, there is no reaction of the particles on the Hamiltonian or on the potential. The potentials are determined by the material content of the world and in turn enter into the equation that determine the motion of the particles. So the potential that enter in the classical physics, of course, depend on where the, or the particles that exist, okay? Mm. Because they are the charges or the gravitation, etc. is of course due to the material content of the world. But nevertheless, they don't act on the potential once they are determined in this way. Mm -hmm. And you can think of the wave function in much the same way. The material content of the world determines the, determines the potential that enters Schrodinger equation, and this determines the evolution of the wave function, which in turn guides the motion of particles. We can think also an analogy <coughs> with general relativity. In general relativity, the material content of space determines the geometry of space-time and that in turn determines the motion of particle. So you can understand perfectly by analogy, 
even with classical physics or general relativity, the role of the, 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 the way the material content of the universe acts ultimately on the motion of the particles. Uh, yes, and uh, it could be made very clear also by uh, what you, you are about to, to say uh, in the next uh, slide, that the if you give uh, the the wave function a nomological uh, state two instead of an ontological one, which means that if you take the wave function to be part of a law of nature uh, instead of uh, representing matter, you avoid uh, this uh, this objection of the. Um, uh... Yeah. Yes, I know. I, okay. So what you are saying is that I can think of the wave function as like the Hamiltonian, like a law. But I don't want to go into the discussion of whether it's a law or not. Uh, some people like that, some people don't like that. I have no strong opinion about that. But if you want to think of it that way, then it's a way to understand why there is no action, there is no reaction uh, mm. of the particles on the laws. Then a question that was asked in the French, the videos in French, people ask, what creates a pilot wave and does it disappear? Well, it's neither created and doesn't disappear. And as I say, it's probably simple to think of it as a natural law rather than an ordinary wave, like a sign of light wave. And it's a law because it guides the motion of the particles. Remember also that for more than one particle, the wave function is defined on configuration space, R3N for N particles, and not on ordinary space R3 on which other physical waves are defined. We can assume that there is a wave function of the universe that determines the motion of all particles. And the wave functions used in practice can be seen as restriction to particular cases of the universal wave function. That's a way to think to think about the whole, uh, you know, the wave function. And it doesn't disappear, it's not created, it's just there, like the Hamiltonian is there, or the potentials are there. Then people ask, does the De Bruyne-Bohm theory really solve the measurement, the problem of the collapse? Yes, because there is no collapse in principle, but in practice, a similar can be used, but it has no fundamental role. So if you could take this experiment again, and if you detect the particle over there, once you detect it with a measuring device, a big measuring device, you can forget about that part of the wave function. And that is, of course, something which then in practice remain that you reduce the wave function, but of course you reduce it according to where, in which part of the wave function, in the, the support of which part of the wave function the particle actually is. So there is something, the, the, it has nothing to do with our observation. Once we observe, we can indeed, in, from practical point of view, ignore that part of the wave function. But then of course people say, oh, but there are these empty waves, namely this wave in principle continues to exist, but it doesn't have anything to do with the future of that system. So we call it an empty wave because it has no particle in its support. Isn't this shocking? Well, no, no. In ordinary quantum mechanics, they also exist. They are the postulate of reduction of the collapse simply eliminates them by decree in a way that depends on our observation, which I don't like. In the Debray Bohm theory, they are eliminated for practical, not principal reason. And the existence of these empty waves is not really more astonishing than the existence of ele electromagnetic waves in a vacuum. I mean, for example, here, I probably have electromagnetic waves of all sorts of things in this room, but they are not detected because they don't act on matter because there are no, no, no radio or no TV, uh, uh, you know, um, mm. detecting them. Ah, now we come to the mo one of the most serious objections. Can the De Bruyne-Bohm theory be extended to quantum field theory? Starting in the 30s, you see, classical physics had two parts. There was the, the part of classical mechanics, which is the motion of particles. And then there was electromagnetism. And if you wish general relativity, but let's put that aside, you have uh, electromagnetism that uh, introduces electromagnetic fields. So the basic uh, entities that exist in classical physics are particles and fields. And ordinary quantum mechanics dealt with particles. And then people were immediately saying, yes, but can we do it for quantum fields? And that was developed during the 30s and 40s and 50s, etc. And there is a sort of practical way to uh, use quantum field theory, but without 
to thinking about the boiled bowl. And then a lot of people throw that to me and they say, ah, uh, I'm sure you can't do it for quantum field theory, so let's get rid of, let's forget about the boiled bowl. In fact, they are ignorant because uh, the question was already addressed by Bohm himself in 1952. My reaction is twofold. First, there is a philosophical one, if you like. Even if the answer was negative, I say we don't know how to extend it. The fact that the De Bruyne Bohm theory solves all the classical problem of quantum mechanics, the role of the observer, Schrodinger's cat, EPR Bell paradox, etc. I mean, all the discussion with uh, EPR and Bohr and uh, and Bohr, etc. All these things were in the context of non-field, I mean, particle or classical quantum mechanics. Then I think it's very interesting because it allows you, it shows that you can do things that have been declared impossible by so many bright physicists. And I think it's important to, you know, then you say, okay, let's wait, let's now try to uh, extend, do this extension rather than using this supposed non-extension to ignore the double boom theory. And the second answer is that there exists extension of the double boom theory. But the first problem is that these theories are very poorly defined mathematically, unlike ordinary quantum mechanics, and consequently, so are these extensions. What's more, there are several ways of making such extension. Reference will be given the description, and it is not easy to determine which is the best. And that's 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 the situation. But the situation is not at all that we can't do an extension. If you want to do an extension in the same way that we do a formal quantum field theory, then that can actually be done. Mm. <laughs> then there is a question about the ether. They say, what is the mean? What is the medium medium in which the wave function propagates itself? Well, the wave function is a rather abstract object. It's a function defined on configuration space, and therefore it does not propagate in ordinary space. So you can't say there is a return of the ether. The ether being the, the medium in which electromagnetic waves are supposed to propagate themselves and Later, people say, well, but these waves can propagate in vacuum, so we don't need the ether, okay? But the ether was existing, if it existed, it existed in ordinary space. And so we don't, it's an abstract object. And then finally, the, the difficult question is, how can the non-locality of the double boom theory be reconciled with special relativity? I will explain why there is a problem. But the question is who of Alice and Bob really measure the spin of his particle first and what meaning can this expression have in a relativistic framework? Okay, that's an important and difficult question. You must start by stressing that the conflict with relativity is due to non-locality, not to the double boom theory as such. And in video two and three, non-locality is an unavoidable property of our world. So we don't need, we don't have, you know, uh, because of the boil boom, we have this problem of, no, the boil boom is non-local, it has to be. And then there's a conflict between mm -hmm. non-locality and relativity, which I will explain in the next slide. Yes, this conflict issue has, arises. It has almost nothing to do with the boil boom theory. But nothing, it's, nothing, nothing, nothing. I mean, it's a problem. It, it, there is a problem in the boil boom theory because uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it is non-local. But the conflict yes. arises from the fact that in special relativity, the notion of simultaneity is relative to the reference frame we use. Something very strange, but you see, to say that some event on the moon happens at the same time as I move my hand here, it's not something which makes sense independently of the frame. It may be true in our frame of reference where we are at rest, but then if you somebody describes the same thing in a fast moving rocket, he may say, or she may say, that uh, I move my hand before the event on the moon, or I move my hand after the event on the moon, that depends on 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 what the rocket does. So that's called a, referen a frame referen a, a reference frame. Mm. And the question is, when when you have this collapse or something, or the fact that there is an action at a distance, Alice measures the spin, and then she acts on Bob's side, okay? But of course, if Bob's measure the spin first, then he acts on Alice's side, okay? And the question is who measure the spin of her and his particle first has no answer independent of the reference frame we use. In some reference frame, Alice will measure her spin and collapse the wave function or do 
d'analogousting in the braid bone theory, or, or the, it will be Bob who do it first. But that's, of course, very complicated. And, uh, and that's the, the problem is that if Alex acts first in some frame, Bob will act first in another frame. And that, of course, is very contradictory with our notion of causality. So because for, we think, yeah. Yes, if, uh, for, for a pair of uh, uh, untangled uh, particles, uh, like the EPR1 uh, singlet state, uh, if the, the, the fact that Alice, uh, for example, um, does her experiment or measurement first, uh, change the result of uh, on the Bob side. Yeah, that, that's it. So, so the 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 chronological order as uh, is uh, important. Yeah. Yes. That's, yeah, the, oh, that's the point. Yeah, that's the point. But of course, it's chronological order depends on uh, which reference yes. frame you are talking. Yes. And that's the whole problem. So the notion, of course. You could think that Alice causes the wave function to collapse on both sides, or Bob's cause is the fun wave function or collapse on both sides, or whatever he places that in mm. the bread room. But uh, who does it first it depends on the frame. So you can't say, you know. Mm. So it seems to be that the dilemma is the following. Either you abandon the notion of cause and effect. That's something that some people have sympathy for, because cause and effect may be some sort of thought of some Aristotelian or some medieval uh, notion that has no place in physics. I mean, so Russell thought that, I mean, there was, one can discuss, there can be philosophical argument against this notion of cause and effect. Or you introduce a privilege frame in reference in which causality really takes place and in which really Alice or, or Bob really acts first. The problem is that this frame of reference must be unobservable. Because I won't explain why, but it's uh, it's uh, it's a pro it's if it was observable, then of course you would be able maybe to transmit information. Um, I mean uh, messages faster than light or something like that. So it has to be you have to assume. But for example, you could assume that that frame of reference, preferred frame of reference, is related to the material content of the universe or something like that or to the wave function of the universe, if, if there is such a thing. I'm not saying I advocate that, but that's a possibility. But none, uh, neither branch of this dilemma is pleasant for me, but I don't see how the dilemma can be avoided. So that's, of course, the difficult question. But as I say, it has really nothing to do with the breakbone theory. In the next video, we'll finish the series by discussing philosophical and cultural issues surrounding quantum mechanics which is something we already discussed a little bit mm. in the first video where we had all these strange statements about, you know, physics not being about the world, but about our observation, etc. Okay, mm. that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.